All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the C Show. We got your boy Chris here uh, tonight. I have a very special guest on the show, the Kennedy and Tippett researcher, Matt Douthit. Matt, how are you tonight? I'm all right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, how long have you been um, involved or interested in the uh, murder of uh, Officer J.D. Tippett? Not a whole, whole lot. For many years, I naturally assumed that Oswald did not shoot JFK, but that maybe in self-defense he shot Tippett. But then I read Mark Lane's book, and I was just absolutely floored stunned that i did not even know the basic evidence of tippet case <laughs> so so that's what changed, when, changed my mind. Well, when you say in self-defense you mean that uh he tippet stopped him and then he defended himself against uh, an, a false arrest is that what you're meaning or how, how exactly would you mean i that? didn't even go i wasn't even thinking that far okay i hadn't i hadn't studied tippet at all I didn't even know the basic facts of the case until I read Mark Lane's two chapters on it. That's the judgment. Um, You know, I'd never really given any thought to the uh, Tippett case until I actually read uh, the part in uh, uh, Rush to Judgment. So um, tell me, uh, uh, so tell me what happened. Um, Oswald's walking down the street, Tippett sees him and stops him and take us from there. No, no, that's the official story. Okay. (laughs) And that's the official story of what's claimed. All right. Oswald was. So what was he doing when this happened? Or, or I mean, Tippett didn't stop him or what? Or, you know. Uh... J.D. Tippett stopped a man who was walking through the neighborhood. He stopped him. Uh, he talked with this man through the vent window of his car. Okay. Tippett got out of his car, and as he was walking around the front of his car, the man shot him several times across the hood of the car and killed him. Okay. And then ran off. Um, And and that is just about the only thing that everyone agrees happened. Now, um, but it is not true, Matt, that the only person who actually witnessed it was Helen Markham. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, she did pick him out of a lineup, correct? In her testimony, they asked her if she identified anyone and she said no. Well, I think the actual question was, did you see anybody that you knew from that day or you recognized from that day? She said no. And then she said no, no, no. And then she said yes, yes. And then she ended it with, I looked at this man, I wasn't sure. But I had cold chills just run all over me. So I know Captain Ball put his. Put, did you? Was there a number two man? Um. Now are we talking about back when you said the cold chills? I know what you're talking about then. Are we talking about back uh, when I said that about um, um, uh, you know, recognizing? Are we are we still in the lineup? Or are we back in her Warren Commission testimony? No, there's no document from that day where she says okay. that she picked anyone out. Okay. Okay. So on the day of the lineup, there's no document that says she picked out Lee Harvey Oswald. Correct. There's no document that's signed by her or anything. Yeah. Nothing. Well, so, really? so you have, yeah. Huh. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so what we have, so what we have to do is we have to rely on her testimony. And they said, did you identify anybody in the lineup? No, sir. And if you line it all up in her testimony, she said, you know, she says, no, 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 no. Yes, yes. And then she ended it with, I wasn't sure. Well, um, I mean, Tom, if you're talking wrong, I mean, didn't, wasn't the question supposedly, did, did you recognize anybody from that day or, or, or something to that, to that effect? And that's when Council Wimball said, did you see a number two? And that's when she said, yes. Yeah, that's what I said. If you line it all up, how about we read it right now? You want to read that? Yeah, go ahead. Please, go ahead. Okay, so this is from the testimony. Did you recognize anyone in, in the lineup? No, sir. You did not? You did not see anybody 
I have asked you that question before. Did you recognize anyone from their face? From their face, no. Did you identify anybody in these four people? I didn't know. I didn't know nobody. I know you didn't know anybody, but did anybody in that lineup look like anybody you had seen before? No, I had never seen none of them. None of these men. Not one of the four. Not one of them. Not one of all four. <laughs> no, sir. And then the magic question, was there a number two man in there? And then she's like, oh, number two is the one I picked. Yeah. Number two is the one I saw. She's the officer. And then she ended this with, I looked at this man. I wasn't sure, but I had cold chills just run all over me. So she ended this with saying she wasn't sure. So that's, so that's and the Warren Commission interprets this as a positive identification. That's not a positive identification. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll go along with that. Um, it was a very leading question he put in her, in her mouth. But do you not think that was kind of, um, you know, maybe she, the way she was, you know, when he asked the question, did you not rec- did you recognize him by that day? No. I mean, could she not be thinking in her mind, I never recognized that nobody before that day? No. They asked no. her over and over, and she identified. No. She said several times that she didn't identify anybody in the lineup. And then, she, and then she said she ended it with, "I wasn't sure." I mean, even Council Ball said she was a fruitcake. I mean, you don't think she could have been misunderstanding his question? He said that she was a a, a quote utter screwball. Yeah, but you don't think she could have been misunderstanding his question? No, as I just read you, he asked her over and over and over. What people are saying now is that, oh, well, she might have been confused in her testimony, but she still identified him. On November 22nd, but as I just told you, there's no document from that day where she says she had she picked anybody. There's no document from that day. <laughs> so that so that argument so that argument is is bunk. Um, of the other people, um, look, I mean, for do you want to go on the lights or you want to go to what else happened that day? Uh, it's your show, man. Okay. Sure. Story. Okay. story. Um, Oswald starts to uh, fool with his revolver. Uh, he looks at Helen Markham. Um, whoa, whoa, apparently- whoa, 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 whoa! You mean the man? You see what you did there? You said Oswald. Okay. The okay. man. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, we'll go with the alleged. How about that? The alleged killer uh, starts the to killer. the killer. The killer. The uh, killer yeah. starts to. Fumble with his revolver. Um, unloading shells. I think he drops two there at the scene. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he takes off um, towards William Whaley's cab. No, um, not William Whaley's. William Scoggins. Sorry, William Scoggins. I always get the mix. Uh, William Scoggins' cab. Uh, Scoggins hears him say something. Poor dumb cop, poor damn cop. Um, so he takes off. Uh, there's shells that are found in some bushes, I believe, by the Davis sister's house. No, first they were found in a bush by witness Don, Donnie Benavides. Yes. Yeah, and he turned them over to the police, and then, and then later that day there were two more shells found on the side of the Davis sister's house. He put them in a cigarette pack. Yes. That's right. I remember that now. Okay. Uh, come on the radio. Now, um, what time do you believe that the shooting took place? What time? Yeah. I would say about 109. All right. Well, um, and I've heard the transcripts uh, that went over Dallas radio. They happened at 117. Um, so do you think they left Tippett laying in the street for eight minutes? Wait, you you mean the time that the dispatcher was made aware was at 116? I think that's what you're saying. I think that's what we're talking about, right? The, the, the tapes, uh, Jerry Daly played these for me, and they went over at 116, 117. Um, yeah. Do you think they left Tippett laying in the street for eight minutes without I rendering 
I would say about six or seven minutes, yeah. So during six or seven minutes, what were these people doing? No, people were, were huddled around the body. There was a blanket that was thrown over him. People were calling the police, things like that. But what town did they actually, was it T.J. Bowie who came over? Uh, T.F. Bowie. T. Yeah, sorry. Bowie. Um, and he came over at that time and said there's a policeman been shot? Yes, correct. So, he, made that, mean, he made that call at 116. Yep. So they left him laying there for eight minutes without offering medical aid, getting an ambulance out there, trying to... About seven, about six or seven minutes, yeah. He laid in the street. My thing is, is uh, being a former military and people go down, you don't leave a, a somebody shot in the street for six minutes. You immediately start rendering aid. No one gave him any aid or CPR uh, at the scene. All they did was throw, was throw a blanket over him. Uh, that's what I'm that's saying. All they did. Until but the ambulance came. What I'm saying is, in in that situation, you know, six people are, from my experience, are going to start rendering some type of aid. Um, yeah, but they didn't. Now, okay. They did. Uh, maybe it was shock. Uh, I have a hard time believing they left him there six minutes, but you know, that's why. Here, here, huh? Why? Why do I have a problem believing it? Like I said, I was in the military. I mean, when when your comrades go down, you're immediately over there. Well, we're not in the military. This is a residential street in 1963. I mean, I've I've started rendering uh, aid to people in a restaurant before that I thought. Well, yeah, well, of course, that's what happens, but that's not what happened here. Every situation is different. No one bothered to to help him, him but – T.F. Bowley, he did he did inspect his body, but he said he was dead once he looked at him. So, but no, no one gave him CPR. Was CPR even around back then? Or I don't, I don't know. You know, and if when he looked at it and saying the, I think the final was a headshot. Okay, yeah, I guess I, you know. So what's your point? Good. So what's your point? Well, the point is that I'm making is you said they're standing around for six minutes. It looks like they would have converged on him. To find out, hey, is this guy still responsive? Is this guy still breathing? Uh, checking yeah. his body. You can't ar- you can't argue about what you would have done. All we know is is what happened, and no one tried to, you know, CPR or anything like that. So I this isn't even an issue because no one tried to give him CPR. So I've never actually even heard someone even ask that before. So all they did was throw well, a blanket I, I, over him. <laughs> What I said was render aid. Um, yeah. You know, we didn't it know didn't if it happen. Was there. It didn't happen. Well, no, I mean, there was, it's as simple uh, as that. Well, obviously, there was no reason to. I mean, it, well, a headshot. I mean, you're not know about that. So what's um, your question? So what's your question? Well, my question was, and you know, we're just going around in circles now. We can go yeah. on to. Let's talk about things. Okay, so. Uh, yeah. he got past some, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 who must I just say, uh, uh, Scoggins, uh, or I Callaway. think what you're trying to say is, is, uh, is, uh, what's the evidence for him lying in the street for six minutes? Is that yeah. what your, is my, that my question, what your question is? That's a long time for somebody. Is what it's <laughs> sure. Here's the evidence. Here's the evidence of him lying in the street for, you know, five, six minutes. Donnie Benavides said he stayed crouched down for, quote, a few minutes in his truck because he was afraid the man was going to come back and start to do more shooting. Uh, That's in his Warren Commission testimony. Then we have the testimony of Barbara Davis. She testified she called the police, went to Tippett's body, and stayed with it for, quote, five minutes. That's volume three, page 345. And then we have her sister-in-law, Virginia Davis, she told the FBI that she went to Tippett's body after Barbara called the police and, quote, a few minutes later after that. Then we have uh, Harold Russell. He told the FBI that after watching the killer run away, 
He walked two blocks to the crime scene, had a couple conversations with bystanders, and then, quote, five minutes later, the police arrived. That's uh, volume 21, page 383. And then we have Jim Burt. He said that he and Bill Smith immediately ran to Tippett's body and, quote, stood there a few minutes. Then they went down Patton Avenue to look for the killer, searched the alley, and when they came back, the ambulance hadn't arrived yet. Finally, we have Sam Ginyard. He testified that he and Ted Calloway, after watching the killer flee, they went to the crime scene and, quote, stood there a while until the ambulance arrived. That's volume seven, page uh, 398. So, yes, about, you know, five, six minutes elapsed until the police yeah. were notified. Yeah. notified. Yeah. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just what happened. So it shouldn't even be an issue. Tell me how flexible that is. Um, this is pre-digital watches. Um, nobody's standing around looking at them. Um, I doubt they're paying attention to them. Um, now, are you saying that, and, and I can believe this too, that some of the people, like you said to me, Domingo, stayed in this truck, that some people stayed where they were at because they were afraid that the killer would come back? One and, person. Huh? One person said that, yeah. Okay. It crashed down. Um, so, um, and, and it was, uh, was it, it was Callaway or Scoggins that uh, got his weapon. I was getting them mixed up. They got his weapon and went searching for him. That was Callaway. And, uh, and you said hey, something man. about, you know, this isn't, they didn't have the digital watches back then. This isn't about what time it was. This is what they said they did, these witnesses. So it's not a matter of time. It's a matter uh, of... What they said they did. Well, you know, that's to me that's an argument that's you know, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. That that that's not really relevant to me. On on. Yes, it is. That, well, it isn't to me. On um. <laughs> okay. But, um. So uh the 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 funeral, but the funeral didn't the uh, ambulance pick him up at one fifteen. No, the ambulance picked him up around one one eighteen or one nineteen. Because it was just around the corner, I believe. Yes. Uh, from where he was at. Okay. All right. So uh, now um, I'm trying to remember some of who came there. So uh, Jimmy Burt uh, seen the killer. Um. Yes. Uh, that seen him take off running. Uh, jacket gets shed and thrown up under the um um God, what did he throw his jacket under? The official story is that the killer shed his jacket and threw it up underneath a car in a parking lot yeah. that was of a gas station. Of um, a, yeah, the gas station. Now, um some of these witnesses that some you know, they're all still in my mind. But from Tom Oswald take off running. They were packed one witness to the next, correct? Now, you just said Oswald. You should have, you know, that's, <laughs> you mean me. the killer. Uh, um, it, it, uh, let's just say, let's call it a slip, because I'm used to saying it. Um, feel free to correct me. The killer, the killer. That's how it should be, yeah, the killer. The killer was packed from one witness to the next as he was fleeing. Mm -hmm. Is it? They seen him. Okay. Um, the next time when he came out on the street, he straightened up, at like, at, you know, at the school and was walking down, um, the sidewalk and was seen in Johnny Brewer's, um, that, um, foyer, correct? Foyer, yes. Cop cars come screeching by and he looks in the window. We're talking about Oswald now. Yes. Oh, 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 okay. All right. Let's back up this thing. So, the person who I was talking about earlier, the killer, did they pass off from one person to the next? What happened to him? Don't know. So, these people have all seen him. He just disappears. Uh, Not disappears. He, yeah, he, we this, don't know what happened to him. He just, yeah. You know. All right. So, you know, Oswald is seen in Johnny Brewer's foyer. Correct. Oswald was seen in Johnny Brewer's foyer, yes. 
Where did Oswald come from? He was last seen at the street corner outside of his rooming house across the street where there happens to be a bus stop. And, and then he was next seen, as he just said, Johnny Brewer's uh, shoe store on Jefferson Street. So, um, Oswald starts walking down the street. Johnny says, hey, mind the store. Um, follow Oswald up there. Julia posts outside smoking a cigarette. Um, no, she's not smoking a cigarette now. She, 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 she didn't come out. She was not smoking a cigarette at that time. No, no. Okay. What happened was she was in her little ticket booth, and there were cop cars, you know, screeching down the street, and she wanted to see what the heck was going on. So she left. So she left her booth and she went out out front. Why well, didn't Oswald buy a ticket? That's actually a good question. A, a researcher named. Uh, Jones Harris asked Julia Postal, did you sell Oswald a ticket? And she just burst into tears. So, you know, it's it's possible that she sold him a ticket, but um, let's just assume that the official story is correct. That's just a little side story, but let's just assume that the official story is correct and he goes into the Texas theater. Okay. Um, but. So, uh, goes in the Texas Theater, uh, didn't buy a ticket. Um, he had, uh, I think, um, $13 in his pocket and didn't buy a ticket. Something like that. Um, you have a, a theory on why he didn't buy the ticket? No. So, what time would this be, um, that he supposedly bought this ticket? I didn't say he did buy a ticket. I'm saying when he uh, entered the theater. Uh, I, I rephrased that wrong. What time, okay. what time do you think this was that he supposedly entered the theater? That's <laughs> another interesting question. Uh, Johnny Brewer said that it was at 1.15, <laughs> which yeah, that's the time that, uh, and uh, officially, according to the Warren report, Officer Tippett was shot at 1.16. So if Johnny Brewer saw Oswald go in at 150. I mean, you know, that game over. If Again, if that's true. Uh, you said the, the Warren Commission said 116? Yes, sir. It's page 158 of their report. Because, I mean, and, you know, uh, that's kind of cutting it close then, isn't it? If he shot at 116 and then they're over police radio at 116. Um, there's not much of a time there, but anyway, so, uh, that's it. Once we'll say 115, he enters the theater. Um, now there's been stories that came out. Ah, depends on how you want to believe. Um, Butch Burroughs comes out years later and says that he sold Oswald popcorn. Mm -hmm. Uh, in his original testimony, he said, no, no. You're saying that Bush Burrell said that he sold Oswald popcorn and when he came in? No. What happened was in his Warren Commission testimony, they asked him, did you ever see Oswald come in? And he right. said no. And he said no. And that's true. Right. However, if you actually sit down and talk with him and you ask him, did you see Oswald come in? No. And then you ask him, did you ever see Oswald that day? And, and he'll say yes. He said what happened was he was bending over, stacking candy. He heard the doors open behind him. And then about 15 minutes later, Oswald came out of the theater and he sold him popcorn. So, so this is 130, 130-ish, 125, something more around there. We don't know the exact time, but somewhere around there, yeah. So, yeah. So Oswald, um, you know, won something. So, um you know, Oswald for not being a big eater, I mean, he's, he's kind of hungry that day, right? I mean, cheese sandwich, apple, now a bag of popcorn. Yeah, it's it's uh, funny how uh, food pretty much, <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone has ever made this argument, but it's pretty kind of humorous that food exonerates Oswald. <laughs> you know, how he, uh, he was seen in the lunchroom. Eating his lunch, eating his lunch just before the shooting, and uh, he was seen 74 seconds after the shooting of Candy uh, buying a Coke, 
and then he was seen at the time the tip was killed uh, buying popcorn. So uh, it's kind of funny how food exonerates him. <laughs> so uh, I guess maybe he, he went out and bought the popcorn after he had been there. So, uh, so according to what I've read, and I don't know how true this is, that this is a theater that I've been in it, but they said there was a theater that seats nine, 900 people or something, and uh, there was maybe 25 or 30 in there that day. And he walks up to the odd spot uh, sitting and sits beside somebody on the wall, against the wall, Jack Davis. Um, are you familiar with that story? Yes. Uh, you know, I've tried to find his story on the Texas um, uh, uh, portable or something. So uh, what's the story? He sits beside Jack Davis, and what, what happens? I mean, Jack Davis was, he was 18 years old right. in 1963. And he was in the movie theater. The movie started at one o'clock, and du- and during the opening credits, which would which was the first twenty minutes of the movie, uh, he said that Oswald came in and sat right next to him, and he was thinking, "What the hell?" Because this is like you know almost a thousand seats, and this guy's sitting right next to me. And then yeah. he gets up and sits next to someone else, and so on and so forth. And that's very common with you know you've seen the movies. That's what people do who are involved in plots and conspiracies, they they usually meet people in movie theaters. Uh, so you believe that, um, <clears throat> that Oswald was there to make a contact? Based on what I just described, yes. Uh, there's, well, no, there's nothing else you could conclude, really. Now, now and, and, and we've all seen the movies or something. Wouldn't there be something to tip him off if there was a contact sitting in there, uh, you know, guy with maybe a red shirt, uh, you know, blue pants, um, a white scarf or anything. We, we, we just know what was seen. He was, he was obviously looking for someone and, uh, but, and then the cops, they burst in and, and they arrest him. So, you know, uh, it seems it, like whoever was going to meet him be, at one time, Say it again. Didn't he sit beside? Wasn't one of the people he sat beside a pregnant woman? Yep. Okay, so the so the cops come in and uh, stage lights come off, and I believe um, they may have gave him a false sense of security. They said, "Sir, stand up, show me some ID." Um, goes on. Now let's go back to the back because I've had people argue me this again. Um, uh. Uh, Baker, I mean, uh, McDonald shows up and supposedly Oswald says, well, it's all over now or this is it, and strikes the officer. Draws his weight with a pistol and the webbing of his hand kept it from firing. Now, some people say that didn't happen. Um, what's your take on it? Did he uh, struck the officer and try to fire him, or a lot of people say, "Oh my God, he, you know, if he's innocent, why did he try to kill a cop, and why do you, you know, fight?" Well, us critics, we believe that Oswald was entangled in the conspiracy, and so therefore, you know, this could happen, but that doesn't mean that he shot the president. He's involved in the plot, so therefore, you know, and they're about to arrest him, so of course he would fight the police. And, of course, he would act suspicious, like, get his gun and, you know, all that stuff. So, yes. So so it makes sense that he would be acting suspiciously during all this. So let's go back to the killer. Where's he at now? He's gone. Like, just vanished, dipped. He's caught a bus and... Um, He's he, no just split. Okay, now the um, pistol that Oswald had on him, he had the same type of ammunition that was found at the scene. Yeah. The, mm-hmm. the uh, 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 God, the um, head of the uh, I can't think of the head of the um, the Illinois State. Um, 
Um, I can't think of his name. Uh, but anyway, the, the weapon that Oswald had on him had the same kind of definition that was found in the same. Uh, the, um, I can't think of his name. He was head of the Illinois Crime Board. He testified that it was to the exclusion of all others. Um, four of the bullets, or three of the bullets, too mangled. One of the bullets he tied to the weapon that Oswald had. Okay, so first of all, you said that it's a big coincidence that the same ammunition was found at the crime scene. Well, well actually, actually, those two yeah, brands, was, actually, those two brands are the most common brands of ammunition. So okay. no, it's not a big well, coincidence. I, 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 I didn't say it was a coincidence. I said that both of them was found on. And let me tell you a little quick story right here. It's really kind of funny. So one of my friends um, asked me one time, he said, what's the best pistol to carry? And I said, um, "My, uh, I said here, I said, I carry a 38 revolver. It's a lightweight, five shot. I said, here. So I opened the chamber up, took the rounds out, handed it to him, and I looked down in my hand, and I was like, huh, there was two Remington and uh, three Winchester 38 specials. So, uh, no, I don't think it's a coincidence that he had two different types of weapons. Um, regardless, one of the bullets matched his weapon. Okay, so first of all, as I said a second ago, those are those two types of ammunition are the two most common brands of ammunition. So, no, it's not a coincidence that okay. the same ammunition was found at, at the crime scene. I'm very familiar with that argument. Now, you said that, that this guy named Nickel, Joseph Nickel, he claimed that, in his opinion, one of the bullets from Tippett's body could be traced to Oswald's pistol. But every other expert who has like eight other firearms experts disagree with him. Um, okay. Well, uh, they disagree with it. Yeah, the bullets could never be traced to Oswald's revolver. That's where like the the uh, the bullets are traced to the shells. Wait, say it again. Bullets are going to be traced to the shells. No, there's no scientific tests where you can trace bullets to shells. No. The bullets will. The bullets. Okay. The bullets. All right. All right. All right. Let me go through this again. You're saying the bullets cannot be traced to the shells. There's no scientific test where you can link a shell to a bullet. There, there is no test for that. Uh, when you're doing ballistics, um, and I, I forgot about for everybody. First of all, um, I want to tell you who these other guys. Um, that you said um, testified, they testified that these uh, could not be, tra that the bullet could not be tra traced to a shell or sh could not be traced to um, Tibbet's body? No, what I said was the bullets could not be linked to the pistol. Okay. So the bullets could not be linked to the pistol. Correct. And who, which, just curious, I mean, what uh, were their uh, qualifications? Those are the firearms experts. He testified before the Warren Commission, and he testified before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. They all concluded that the bullets removed from Tippett's body could not be linked to Oswald's pistol. Okay. So is there anything that can trace it to it? Okay, so the only thing that apparently links Oswald to the Tippett murder is the shells that are now in evidence match to the gun. But there okay. are a lot, but I but there are a lot of problems with those shells, and we can go into that. Okay, all right. I mean, if you got time, then I would love to listen. Sure, ask away. Explain how they can be traced to that. They can match it. You know, this one guy saying it's the exclusion of all others. 
these guys are saying it doesn't match. What What is causing one expert to say it's matching and eight to say it's not matching? Does that question make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, so as I said, all of the firearms experts for the Warren Commission and the HSCA could not link the bullets to Oswald's pistol, but the Warren Commission had an independent guy, expert, as you said, who claimed, oh, yes, I can match it up, but the other experts do not agree with, with him. So it's, okay. kind of like, so it's kind of like a, you know, voila moment, you know. Oh, they can't match, and then they bring in this independent guy. It's like, oh, yes, well, I can maybe match one of them, but in his, you know, <laughs> one of them Did might have matched. Now that... hmm? Did all of these guys testify? Yes. They want... Yes, and they the all took in the HSCA. Huh. And the Warren Commission chose to believe uh, Nicola, uh, um I can't even think of his name. Nickel. Um, okay, Nickel. Essentially, yeah, yeah. That is, um, hmm. so now tell me about the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Did they conduct the same test? Yes, they did. They conducted the same tests, and they agreed with the other experts, firearms experts, before them that the bullets could not be linked to Oswald's pistol. Yeah, this is a ba- yeah, this is yeah, this is a basic fact that the bullets cannot be linked to Oswald's pistol. Okay, so if Oswald was not the shooter and this other guy was, I mean, the conspirators had to go a pretty long way to get make sure they both had the same 38, the same shells, and just get lucky enough no. to trace it. No, no, no. Some people don't believe that the Tippett case, or the Tippett murder, was even related to the Kennedy assassination. I tend to think that. I don't think it was related to the Kennedy assassination. Do you, do you believe that it was related to uh, a jealous husband? It's possible, but it's possible, but you know, we have no way of knowing for sure. Um, I read something one time that uh, Tippett was involved in drug running. Have you ever heard anything about that? Now that's an interesting story because during the testimony of Captain Fritz, Alan Dulles suddenly says, hey, I heard a rumor that uh, Officer Tippett was involved in what you just said, drugs. And uh, Captain Fritz said, no, I've never heard of that. And Alan Dallas is like, oh, okay. And he just drops it. So that's a good question. Uh, where did he get that from? Is there any truth to that? So we don't know. It's just something that, you know, we don't know. Well, the reason I asked about that right there, too, is, and, you know, and I'm not the uh, uh, oh, nobody thinks I'm implicating uh, Officer Tippett in anything, but um, I, if I'm not mistaken, Officer Tippett was uh, keeping up two households um, off, That's true. The, off a salary of like $454 a month. And um, that, that, that's, um, you know, uh, that, that's pretty hard to do. I don't care how many, you know, jobs you're working. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's um, true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so what would your opinion be of Tibbet's involvement or just uh, did he get the wrong place, wrong time? You know what? I have to agree with. Larry Harris and Greg Lowry, they are the two experts from Dallas, Dallas researchers who studied this case the most. And they both reached the same conclusion that Tippett was not involved in the conspiracy. So I have to agree with them. With them. I, I don't think that Tippett was involved in the plot or the conspiracy. Do you think that, um, I, that he could have been uh, part of Joseph McBride's theory that he was supposed to drive somebody somewhere and they shot him? No. I personally don't believe that. Um, Okay. I don't believe that either. Okay. So um, here we are further along. Now, Oswald's been arrested. He's uh, taken in. Um, We've talked about the... um, bullets um 
or uh, ballistics on the weapon. Um, don't know how I lost what I was thinking about the shells while I go. I got it confused with something else. Please forgive right. my ignorance on that. Because I was thinking of I was what I was thinking of is I was thinking of bullets matched to a gun and um, it's neither here nor there. Um, so Oswald is originally arrested for the murder of Officer Tiffin. Correct. So, you know, surely the Dallas Police Department had already put two and two together, wouldn't you think? That's actually a good question because uh, the Dallas Police stated that they had no pr- no prior knowledge whatsoever of Oswald and that his arrest was unrelated to the Kennedy assassination. However, um, as officers beat Oswald during his arrest, a witness overhears one of the officers shouting, kill the president, will you? And as they're dragging him from the theater, one of the employees hears another officer say, I think we got our man on both accounts. So that's a so that's very questionable because officially they said, you know, it was unrelated. They had no idea of Oswald. But then, if you also recall uh, when they're bringing him in, he goes, well, naturally, I work in that building. That's much later. We well, yeah, but still he had not he still had not been a been charged with murdering the president when he said that that was much later that night after they allegedly put two and two together and that, you know but um and i don't think that's why i wonder why it would take so long that would be my first suspicion i mean uh president kennedy's been killed we have a dallas police officer been killed uh you know i would be thankful so um What's your, what's your opinion on, on Tippett then? You know, just unlucky guy? I mean, was some type of involvement? Uh, wrong place, wrong time? I mean... That, that's not a problem. We don't really know a, a whole lot about what happened. It, I really wonder about why the man was pulled over. Why Tippett stopped this guy? That's a, that's a, that's a very big question mark. Why did Tippett stop, stop this guy? I mean, I think I could want well, I mean, you've got a guy walking on the street, and there are some reports that he turned around. I don't know if it's no. true or not. No. Right. no. I've, yeah, and, and, I'm, I'm, and whatever I'm saying here, I'm not saying 100% fact. You know, I hear stuff all the time. But, I mean, I could see why he stopped the guy if he matched the height, deal, um no one, but no one except the Warren Report believes that he stopped the man because he thought he was the presidential assassin. No person believes that. So tell me, the Report. tell me if these stories are true. Uh, Tippett is racing around the top ten record store making phone calls. Yeah, that's another story. Just before um, all this happened, he ran into the record store, tried to make a phone call, got no response, and then hopped back in his car, and he was killed minutes later. So that's enough, so that's a, another question mark. And he missed, he met, and, uh, when he was inside, he missed a radio call. So it must have been very, so whatever it was, it must have been very important for him to make that phone call. Now, why Tippett pulled off his regular beat? Yeah, what's he doing out there? He's out of his district. What's he doing out there? Well, officially... Um, the story is that all the officers are going towards Dealey Plaza and that they told Tippett to go into Oak Cliff just, you know, in case something happens, like a robbery or something. Well, um, but yeah, he's out of his district, so we don't really know what he's doing. That's a, that's a good question. So the man killer that Tippett stopped, where was he headed? We don't know. We know that the the man who Tippett stopped was walking through the neighborhood, walking west in the neighborhood, which would actually be coming back towards Oswald's rooming house. So, so that so that doesn't make sense. So, how was this person um, connected or associated with the conspiracy? I never said that. I've, so. I never that, said that the person who shot Tippett was involved in any conspiracy. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. 
Um, so do you think this could just been a random killing? I mean, we see those happen all the time. We have no idea. We have no idea. Um, we just don't know. We don't know why Tippett stopped this man. We don't know what was said. We don't know why he shot him. We just don't know. He was wanted for something else and you know, panicked because Tippett stopped him. Uh, we and, have we have no idea. Okay. Just a guess as anybody's. Okay, so um, Oswald, um, I guess, is arrested and you know for the. Uh, brought in um you know i think um we've covered most of the tippet case uh tonight uh you know not oh no if, oh no no okay. there's a lot that well, we, there, there's, there's, there's probably some stuff i forgot uh there's a lot of stuff my, we didn't cover <laughs> well, okay well refresh my memory because there's something I, you know i may uh, i could have forgot oh yeah, yeah yeah uh uh there's something i want to go back to uh the witnesses sure. the witnesses um uh, what was there Thirteen witnesses that seen Tippett and uh, ad- identified or the murder and identified Oswald. No, there are about twenty-one witnesses total who saw the killer either at the scene running away, and there were five people who on Tenth Street who watched the murder go down. Okay, okay. now you did the explain it because uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I a few months ago. Bill said there was thir- you know, 13 and, and this. And, but then I remember listening to Justin McBride, and Justin McBride said there was a whole lot of other witnesses. Tell me about these other eight witnesses. I want, I want to know the other eight witnesses um, and what they seen and what they said. It's actually more uh, – are you talking about the people who did not take Oswald? Yeah. Who yeah. said about – who did not identify yeah. Oswald? Yes. Oh. Okay, well, it's actually more than eight witnesses. It's actually twelve well, witnesses. Okay. It's actually got, a dozen people. Okay, hold on, hold on. You start since um, we're in this, and you know, let's finish it then. Start with the. You said there's twenty-one witnesses or whatever. Start with the witnesses for me. Go through the witnesses and tell, tell me what they said, and tell me who identified who, and tell me who didn't, and you know, if if you got time for that, or if you feel like it. Sure. Okay, well, first of all, there were five witnesses who watched it go down. Okay, we have Jim Burt. He told reporter Al Chapman and researcher Larry Harris that it was not Oswald. Okay. And then we have the guy with him, Bill Smith. He told the FBI that he couldn't identify Oswald. Okay. Then we have the closest witness, who was Donnie Benavides. He testified that he couldn't identify Oswald. Okay, then we have William Scoggins, taxi driver. He picked the wrong photo in a photo lineup, and he could not ID Oswald as the killer when shown a photo by the FBI. Okay, and then finally we have Helen Markham, and as I said, she testified that she didn't identify anybody in the lineup. So those are the five witnesses who watched it go down on 10th Street. Okay, Okay. uh, they could not identify Oswald except okay. for as I said Helen Markham but if you look at her testimony it's it's a no 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 you know no yes yes and then she ended it with I wasn't sure but okay okay so the, okay. so those are the people who watched it go down and then you have 12 other people who refused to identify Oswald 12 yes there was 12 people who refused to identify him. Yes. I'm not aware of that. Yeah. So I've mentioned two of them already. Donnie Benavides. He could only say that Oswald resembled the guy. That's the best that they could get out of him. Smith, as I said, he told the FBI that he couldn't identify Oswald. Then we go to Warren Reynolds. He told the FBI, quote, he would hesitate to definitely identify Oswald as the individual. And we go to L.J. Lewis. It also says, quote, he would hesitate to state whether the individual was identical with Oswald. Mrs. Clemens, this is from Mark Lane's book, Last Word, quote, when shown pictures of Oswald, Mrs. Clemens said that he was not one of the two men that she had seen. 
Okay, we can talk about her later if you want. Then we have yeah, Frank Wright. Like her and then we have Frank Wright. He said, quote, I've seen what came out on the television and, and in the papers, but I know that's not what happened. Nothing in the world is going to change my opinion. I know what I saw. Meaning it wasn't Oswald. And then we have Mrs. Donald Higgins, who said he, the killer, definitely was not the man they showed on television. And like I also said, we have Jim Burt, who I mentioned earlier. And then we have Robert Brock, where it says, quote, he advised he could not positively identify same as being identical with the individual who had passed him. And we have another guy named Francis Kenneth. According to his FBI interview, it says, quote, he advised he could not identify Oswald as being the individual he had observed leaving the shooting at the scene. And then we have the guy with him, Albert Austin, and, and it says, quote, he advised he could not identify Oswald as being the person who shot the Dallas police officer. And then we have an anonymous witness who wrote, quote, I saw two men, neither of them resembling the pictures I later saw of Lee Harvey Oswald. So those are the 12. Um. So those are the 12 people who could not identify Oswald, who refused to identify Oswald. Now, I mean, I've never heard of these before, but Brad was mentioning, uh, you know, numerous people, because I believe, if correct me if I'm wrong, there was only six people who testified for the Warren Commission, right? Let's see. Uh, Helen Markham, Scoggins, Calloway, Ginyard, Davis, Davis, Benavides, Reynolds. And I think that's it. And, uh, and uh, Smith. And Smith. Well, about six or eight, wasn't it? Yeah, something like that. I wasn't keeping yeah. count, but yeah. No. So um, I, just, I heard you when your last statement was, you said somebody else saw two men shooting? That's another problem. Uh, a couple people said that they saw two men. And uh, it's, you know, it's a real shame that we can't get eyewitnesses, like eyewitness accounts to match up. Now, here's my problem with Clemens. I've read the David Von Pine side where the, the, is cut and they keep getting her talk. So here's a woman who is a little older, let me say it. By the, to me, my thinking is by the time she got outside, she had already seen people start to gather around. So no, I can't, no, she was not inside the house. She was on the front porch. Well, that depends on who you ask now. Uh, you know, uh, I think Spartacus says she's on the front porch. Other sources that say she was in the house. No, she's no. According to her interview with Shirley Martin in 1964, Mrs. Clemens stated matter of factly that she was sitting on the front porch. Well, I'll be happy, I'll be happy to go back and read that. Uh, I know that there, but I know I've read that she was in the house, but I'm not going to split, you know, hairs with there. But out of these the porch. Uh, okay. Anyway, I'm not going to split hairs with you. Now, how many people did you say was there in the vicinity, five or six? And they didn't On, see a second person? Five people saw it go down, yes. Correct. But they did But they did not see a second person. As I said, that's one of the problems. It's very difficult that we can't get eyewitnesses' accounts to match up. Mrs. Clemens said that the other person was across the street. And if the other five people are looking at the scene, are looking across the street at Tippett and the other guy, they're not looking across the street looking for someone else. Does that make sense? So it, yeah. could, be, so it could very well be, you know, witnesses are not, you know, they don't know what they're going to see. It just happens. So, so, they're not, not, so they're not looking for anyone else. They're just looking at the action, which is the squad car and the man who Tippett's talking to. So do you believe Miss Clemens seen two people? I, you know what? I have no reason to doubt her. Tough. I have no reason to doubt her. You know, she, no, I now, don't. I don't, have, I don't have any reason to doubt her. She was a, a yeah. Now, in my opinion, and I'm going to tell you what, whatever it's worth, $3 to buy you a Starbucks coffee. Um, Wait, what'd you say about Starbucks? What'd you say? Huh? I said, you? I said, in my opinion, I said, in my opinion, and $3 to buy you a, star, a Starbucks coffee. But uh, the what way Mark Lane, it was a joke. I said, 
basically my opinion is worthless. You know, my, oh, my opinion, oh, oh. my opinion, of three bucks will buy you a Starbucks coffee. You know, um, Mark Lane tried to make it out to sound like Jack Ruby was one of the shooters. No, you don't think so at all. Short, stocky no. man. No, no, Mark Lane never suggested that Ruby was at the scene. No, the way he described the shooter, you do not feel that he <laughs> was describing Jack Ruby. No. He, Mark Lane never, ever suggested that Ruby was at the scene. I didn't say suggested. I said the way he portrayed it. No. Uh, no. With the pictures. No. no. Um, and how did he get Miss Clemens to explain it? One was a short, stocky man? No. She des- no, no. She described the killer with the gun as, as a short and heavy way before Mark Lane even got to her. Okay. Yeah, way before he interviewed her, she just said, she said that the killer was short and heavy. Okay. The killer was short and heavy. And that's uh, also according to Mrs. Markham and Donnie Benavides. Um, now, I remember that... I, I'd have to go back and refresh my memory, but as I recall... Uh, they described Oswald as a ruddy complexion with curly hair. No, you're that comes from Helen Markham's description of the killer on that day. She told the FBI that the killer was quote 18, red complexion, black wavy hair. I thought Domingo said because when they because Domingo said uh, not quite as ruddy as me. Correct. Oh. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, so he described the killer this way. About 5'11", had a complexion a little bit darker than average, a little bit ruddier than mine. Now, he's Mexican-American, so he said ruddier than mine, so that's yeah. very important. And he had dark hair that was a little bit curly, uh, and he looked like he needed a haircut for about two weeks with a hairline that sort of went square instead of tapered off in the back. Uh, he was the closest witness, so that's the very detailed description of the killer. That and that's from his testimony, volume six, page four fifty to four fifty one. That is not Oswald. <laughs> that's that's well, not Oswald. Have you ever seen the picture of Oswald where he's sitting down, handcuffed, and his hair is all messed up? It looks no. wavy. You've never seen that picture? I'll send it to you. I think I think I know what you're talking about, but no. You don't like the hair looks messed up? Well, his hair's messed up after he was beat up and arrested. So, yeah, he's all <laughs> disheveled. But, yeah, but no. What I just read to you was not Oswald. Not at all. The way he described the typical killer. Okay. Now, let's go to the lineups. There were four lineups conducted, right? There were lineups on Friday and Saturday. So, if they had 21 witnesses, they only called, what, Seven, eight to this? Yeah. Nine? She, yeah, shocking, yeah, shockingly, they did not um, call Donnie Benavides, who was the closest witness. <laughs> that's, it's, it's shocking, but that's just how it is. Did he that's not, how it is. Did he not at first say that he could not identify him 100%? That's the thing. That's what was claimed. But when Mark Lane and Emil D'Antonio caught up with him in 1966 when they were filming their movie, they asked him if he could identify the man who killed Tippett. And Benavides replied, he said, quote, of course, of course I could. I was 10 or 15 feet away. Of course I could. I told that to the Dallas police, but they didn't bring me to the lineup. End quote. So that's amazing. This guy... Domingo Benavides was 15 feet away as the closest witness, and they didn't call him to the lineup. So That's so sad. One of the lineups, and I, I just know how one of them was done, and you may know how all of them was conducted, but I, I remember the one that you saw on YouTube, and Oswald is brought in with these four, four 16-year-old teenagers, Latino, Latino teenagers. No, I mean, no, that's the next day when he was put in a lineup with two teenagers and a Mexican, yes. Okay, got it. Okay, I, I didn't know which time it was, but I just remember him coming and he's in the front, yeah. I'm in a t-shirt with these men, and that way I'll be picked out, and 
Is that yeah. right? So he, yeah, he's shouting out how he's innocent. So it's kind of, so you don't have to be too bright to know who the suspect is. So, <laughs> well, I mean, and, and you know, my question is right there because, uh, um, you know, of all the people in the Dallas field, that's who they got to go in the lineup. The lineups have been a problem I always had with that, that. You know, that's the three or four guys they picked to go in the lineup was a couple of teenage kids. Um, that's the Saturday night lineup. That's in the Saturday lineup. About okay. The teenagers. In the Friday night lineups, uh, he was Lee was thrown in with three men in dress attire. Uh, um, okay. He was told that, that he was told that they had there was detectives or whatever and they had yeah, shirt, uh, two police but, detectives and a jail clerk. One of them had a red vest, and another one had a gray knit sweater, and one had a brown sport coat. And you know, so picture Oswald. Torn T-shirt, bleeding, beat up, bruised, black-eyed, and he's thrown in with these men, three men in dress attire. So, and uh, so you don't have to be too bright to know who the guy is. Therefore, Captain Fritz lied when he testified before the Warren Commission when he said that they all quote fixed themselves where they would look like prisoners. Prisoners don't wear red vests or brown sports coats. Okay. So the other ones, how, how were they conducted? As I said, the Friday night lineups, the other guys in the lineup with Lee were in dress attire. And in the Saturday lineup, Oswald was thrown in with, you ready for it, two teeny boppers and a Mexican. And I've seen that clip many times, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and not only that, as I said, he was also shouting out how he was innocent and being railroaded. So, uh, and, uh, and also, the men in the lineups did not resemble Lee. They were heavier, older. Some of them had blonde hair. Some of them were ruddier. And also, these men gave uh, fictitious names and occupations in the lineups. And Oswald gave his real name and his real occupation. Details which, by that time, were nationally known. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so no wonder five witnesses picked him. How in the world could they not pick him? And the Warren Commission's position, the commission is satisfied that the lineups were conducted fairly. Wow. I'll tell you this right. I even argued on a post the other day. It was about the lineups. And, you know, I, I said I said myself, I said, that this over here, and everybody knows the side with the non-conspiracy side or not long gun. But I said that the lineups were not conducted fair. Those were, you know, it just, you know, who else was they going to pick? Um in that. Yep. Um, so tell me about the shells that were autographed by J.D. Poe. Seven months later, the FBI showed Poe the shells in evidence. And let me just read you this right here. It says, volume 24, page 415. It says, Poe recalled marking these cases before giving them to lab personnel, but he stated after a thorough examination of the four cartridges shown to him, he cannot locate his marks. Therefore, he cannot positively identify any of these cartridges as being the same ones he received from Benavides. Okay. Um, well, I can't remember the officer's name, but there were reports of an automatic being used. Correct. And it, yeah. Now, there was reports of an automatic on the scene or automatic use. Were there Correct. automatic shells found? There was one automatic shell found at the scene, and that's, again, this is a problem because, you know, many witnesses saw the killer tapping out the shells, which means it was a revolver. However, it seems inconceivable that Sergeant Hill could be wrong when he's holding in his hand a shell that says 38 Auto on it. He not only saw it, but acted upon it by making that radio call. Well, remember, if a, a revolver, though, can be adjusted to hold automatic shells from a 38 as regular as regular shells. Oh, really? of mine, yes. Um, because of my thir- yes, because my 38 has had the barrel, and I forgot what exactly you got to do the barrel, but the barrel has to be adjusted. But a barrel, but it can be fixed where it can hold a automatic as well as a regular shell because the revolver I got can hold both automatics and regulars see that's very interesting it's very interesting yeah yeah, yeah um, so 
it's a conundrum because uh, you know Sergeant Hill has in his hand a shell that, as I said, says thirty-eight auto, you know, right on it. He's looking at it, and there's not an automatic shell in evidence right now. But um, but uh, so it's kind of hard to explain that away. But um, there, um, Sergeant Hill told Stavis Stavis Ellis, who who's an officer. He said, yeah, there was an automatic shell found at the scene, but uh, it was unrelated. Ellis. Unrelated? Unrelated, un- yeah. How was a uh, shell unrelated? Maybe it was there before. I mean, this is Texas, you know. Again, this is a big conundrum. It's hard to figure out where that shell came from. Now, if I recall, right, and you can tell me, there, there was four or five bullets that hit Tippett, but there were six shells that was found, uh, or... Yeah, there was one more shell than what there was bullets, if I recall right. See, that's another problem. Um, The bullets and the shells don't match. Three of the bullets were Remington and one was Winchester, but the shells found were two Remington and two Winchester. So some people have suggested that, well, maybe there were five shots and one missed, but that would require a bullet going into a house across the street and the person in that house ran out and he never said anything about you're not gonna believe what happened this bullet crashed through my house he never said anything like that so so again this is another question mark so do you believe there were two shooters on scene if there was another shooter then he would have had to have been missed by the other witnesses as you said but no it doesn't seem that there was two shooters no no it doesn't seem like there were two shooters there could have yeah, been a hard time to, um, I'm not saying there I'm not saying there was another shooter, but there could have been, but we don't know for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that somebody would have seen something. I mean, um, you know, uh, it, you know, I mean, I, I just have a hard time believing there was two there. Um, <clears throat> now, I wanted to ask you something again. We, we touched on earlier and I wanted to come back to and. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Clemens. I want to touch on her. Um, oh, well, we already touched on that. <clears throat> uh, so Oswald, uh, excuse me, the killer, when Tippett stopped the killer, the killer was walking towards Tippett and then turned around and started walking the other direction? No, and no. He was walking ne- away from no, Tippett or he was walking no. towards him. No, the killer was walking towards Tippett heading uh, west the whole time, yes. All the witnesses in the neighborhood um, who saw the man walking through the neighborhood before Tippett even show, pulled up said that he was walking west through the neighborhood. No one said anything about the killer turning around or anything. No, he's walking west. Now, could this – now, according to – I'm not going to keep calling him out. Author, just keep calling this author out because you know, you're listening, but um, – uh, he says that the Tippett Who? murder was a staged Who? event. Joseph McBride. Okay. Um, uh, it was a staged event. Uh, why would this be staged? I don't see any evidence that it was staged, no. I don't agree with that. Um, he also claimed of a second patrol car parked in the driveway. Yeah, that's not a problem. Uh, I don't. There's not a whole lot of evidence for that. It's a, it's really a mess. The evidence for that. Um, even uh, when the times I've talked to him, you know, he talked about a a change of uniform was in one of the back of the cars, and I, I didn't know where he was going with that. Um, oh, are you asking me about the jacket that's in the back seat of Tippett's car? He, uh, thanks. And, st- and you may be right, but is I, and I and I could be wrong, but I but the way I thought I remembered it was it was hanging up like a you know you know change of uniform and it was hanging up in the back, but it could have been a jacket laying in the back of the car. Yeah, photos at the scene show that there was a jacket on a hanger hanging in the back seat of Tippett's car. Yeah, and um, Larry Harris, who was the world's leading authority on Tippett, he, um, I think he put it into that in the 90s when he spoke at a conference. 
at the ask conference and he he said it was a um, that the officers had a long sleeve and a short sleeve uniform and they had just changed over and it was you know 68 degree weather and uh tip it just to take his jacket off and put it in the back you know some probably something as simple as that and here's something i don't understand about his theory or where he come up with because like as you just said uh there's no evidence of the second shooter uh where does he come up with this idea that dallas police show up to order tip it to drive this guy to Redbird, Red, whatever it is, and tip it box, and they shoot him. When the obvious answer to me was, why didn't you just drive him out there yourself? Okay, so I think you're thinking of two different theories. One is the Joseph McBride theory in his book that there was another c- cop car at the scene, and then the other theory was the Roscoe White story about how Tippett was supposedly driving Oswald to red bird and then oswald got out of the car then roscoe white shot tippet so those are two different theories so well, that, uh, hold on. what was that now and, and you may be able to run well, but i thought the last time i remember it was that they had told him to drive him there tippet bought and that's when they shot him now i could have him mixed up with different yeah theories. i i think you're mixing them up yeah and in and my age up, that happens a lot it's okay don't worry, you'll be there soon. Wait, what? I said, I said, at my age, I said, I get things mixed up. You said, that's okay. I said, don't worry, you'll be there soon. Oh, 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 oh okay. Uh, so, yeah, so, so you guys got through those theories. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't find those, I, I don't find those two theories credible. Again, they both have, have him involved. And again, I have to, uh, like I said, I have to uh, concur with Larry Harris and Greg Lowry, who studied Tippett the most, and they concluded that Tippett wasn't wasn't uh, involved in in all this. So, I, I, I looked him, and he talked about. Uh, I believe it was Harry Olson, and he apologized to Marie and said, "I'm so sorry. I was supposed to be there that day." Okay, so you're thinking of. Um, Okay, I see what you're thinking of. No, not Harry Olson. Um, supposedly, um, according to Tippett's father, Joseph McBride talked with Tippett's father, and Tippett's father said that Marie visited him, and she said that she was visited by another officer who said who told her that Tippett was hunting down Os that he and Tippett were hunting down Oswald. Okay, that's what you're thinking about. I believe. I believe that's what you're thinking about. Yeah, not yeah, Harry Olson. Right. Yeah, not Harry Olson. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff runs together now. But yeah, you're probably right on that. There was, yeah. but they were both hunting him down, and he said, "I'm sorry, I was supposed to be there." And, yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, supposedly the su- supposedly this other officer got in an accident. I thought and, he was in a car wreck, right? Allegedly, yeah, allegedly. But there was no police report of the car wreck. Is that right? There is a report. Um, of a car wreck. Yes, there is a report of a car wreck. So, um, was this just a, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I should have been there, or was this something more, you know, sinister? I have, you know, I have no way to know if that story is true. I mean, that is what Tippett's father told Joseph McBride, according to what he was told by the widow, Mrs. Tippett. So that's kind of a, it's kind of hard to tell. We don't really know. I mean, it seems like the, I come away with every time I'm getting the tip of stuff and I read it and I see, you know, ironclad evidence, I come away with, you know, more questions about this right here and this right here. Um, you know, again, one of the things I want to say, I will say Oswald, but I'll say the killer. I've often wondered where they were walking, uh, just walking down the streets of, Dallas that day? I mean, it's impossible to know. It's impossible to know. Yeah. You know, uh, there was something else about Tippett I remember too. Tippett was supposedly ran, or Tippett supposedly worked at a um, uh, skating rink or something and was supposedly not very popular with a lot of the um, kids there. 
Um, Some something like that. Yeah, you no, know, he had a part time job as a security guard at Austin's Barbecue. Now, is uh, that where the, is that where his girlfriend worked? Yes, and I think what you're thinking of is an obscure little detail. I believe that there were a couple of counts where he got mad at a couple of teenagers or something like that. But yeah, I can tell I can tell that you I can tell that you've done your homework because that's like an, an obscure little detail. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, I, I wish my mind was what it was 15 years ago because uh, I no, can no, you're fine. Home. Oh, Ten no, minutes later, I'll forget, and you know I'll have to have people correct me. But I can remember that they said that uh, the kids there were not fond of Tippett because Tippett tended to get a little rough with them over nothing. Um, I don't know if that had something to do with this P- PTSD coming back from uh, World War Two. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, an, yeah, that's an obscure little detail. I don't. Yeah, that's just something that's there. I mean, there, there's so many things that. That uh, I'm not accusing him or, or, or putting him in anything, uh, but you know the things about you know keeping two households up of $454 a month, uh, you know that that that, that in itself um, is impossible. Um, you know I have a question about you know getting pulled off his cliff that day. I understand there's going daily plays, but my thinking is, and you can tell me, of course I'm not a police officer. But, you know, shots ring out, president's dead. Uh, My thinking would be to set up a perimeter blocks around the elite plaza instead of in the plaza itself and make sure nobody gets out instead of rushing everybody into the plaza. Um, You know, that's just my thing. And that's just the military part coming into me. You set up a perimeter, you have checkpoints, nobody gets out, and then you start working your way inward and clearing buildings until you find, you know, looking for whoever you're looking for. Um, but, you know, back to the kids station next there. That's why I just wondered why he and maybe there was somebody else, but if I'm not mistaken, wasn't Tippett the only one that was pulled off his uh, beat? The dispatcher told him and another officer to stay in Oak Cliff while um, everyone else all the other officers went to the plaza, but that's another thing. That officer also went to the plaza, so that's another question. Not a question, but yeah. And so didn't else. Listen, and didn't um, uh, there was some th- did Tippett pull over a vehicle, start searching their car? Yeah, that's another thing. There was a um, a guy named Andrews, James Andrews, who said that. He was pulled over by Tippett, and Tippett uh, searched his car and then left. And that's a – unfortunately, that's an, that's another thing that no one can really quite figure out. Um, we don't know what that was about. I mean, I mean, and I think he was looking at the trunk, too. I mean, obviously, he had to be looking for something. Yeah. Um, you know, and what that was. I mean, so uh, – you know, did um, Tippett know Oswald? Uh, no, most likely not. No. What What about no. the incident about the eggs? The eggs? Yeah, supposedly a few days before the assassination, uh, Oswald was in a restaurant complaining about it the way the eggs was cooked. And oh, oh, to- yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's another story that's really interesting. Uh, on November 20th, so two days before the assassination, um, Oswald was seen at Dobbs House restaurant, and he was complaining about his eggs because they weren't cooked right. And uh, he was, you know, yelling at the waitress, saying, you know, being mean to her. And J.D. Tippett was also in the restaurant as well. So that's another question. So that's another interesting little story. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be nothing. Uh, you know, I, I don't know really what to make heads or tails of that. Um, yeah, supposedly Oswald was at work at that time. But, um, I mean, hey, you know, he was an agent. So, there, you know, maybe he could <laughs> come and go from his work as he pleased. Who knows? But uh, we just know what was reported. Agent. 
So we're gonna have to save that for our JFK interview. Um, sure. Whether he's an agent or not. Um, sure. So for um, but yeah, that's just another story that's there, and it's uh, it's interesting. Well, I mean, if I'm thinking of some other stuff, maybe I've missed uh, that you want to add. Um, anything else that you can think of to ask? Not that I can think of right now. Um, you know, I, I've really enjoyed this. Um. Looks like there's nothing, I can, and I'm sure I can probably come up with something, and you know we can do follow up or something one day on uh, some other stuff. Um, uh, I would like to thank you. You're the first uh, CT who has been brave enough to come on the show. I guess everybody thought I was going to try to. Now, now I'm not a CT means conspiracy theorist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I, uh, well, you know, uh, you know, to me, a conspiracy theorist is a flat earther. Or a you know Boston bombing didn't happen, Sandy Hook didn't happen, no planes hit the tower, moon landing hoax. To me, that's what a conspiracy theorist is. But to me, I'm I consider myself a student, a researcher, you know, a guy who's into the case. You know, the label is irrelevant. You know, the label <laughs> is irrelevant. Why are you saying that? I mean, because I you know somebody called me a researcher the other day, and I said no, 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 no. I said no, I'm not yeah, a researcher. Yeah. I'm a student. I'm a student like, you know, I'd be studying a history class. I, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, a- yeah. The label is irrelevant. Whether you think I'm a conspiracy theorist, I'm not. Whether you think I'm a lone nutter, I'm not. Whether you think I'm a secret lone nutter, I'm not. Whether you think I'm a dumbass, whatever. Listen, the label is irrelevant. I will state what my position is, and we can either address that or not. You know? Yeah, I mean, like I said, whatever label you want to use, uh, Let's say uh, doubter of the, you know, you're the only one who's been brave enough to uh, uh, come on and speak with me. And I guess everybody thought I was going to, uh, uh, you know, attack them. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going to attack you. Then, um, um, you know, no, everybody. Fair attacks. question. Fair question. Uh, and, you know, I said, yeah, I'm going to ask questions, um, but I'm not going to grill you, uh, you know. Because, uh, I mean, that's part of an interview. I mean, I'm, I'm here to ask you questions. And, you know, if – and but, but a lot of people, I guess, thought I was going to grill them or try – I was like, no, I'm not like that. I'm going to – you know, so uh, you was the first person uh, to do this. Um, so you've got to, uh, you know, can go back and tell all the other ones you did it. Uh, but, you know, I, I admire you that for, you know, for having enough guts uh, – or I don't know if I say guts, but to, you know – not be scared enough to come on there and state your position and then and, and you know and lay it out uh articulately i thought you did a very good job um uh better than i expected you to do and i don't mean that um insulting um but i thought you did, did a very good job uh going over the case tonight uh you know you knew a lot of facts names stuff that i forgot so you know i just want to thank you for that and um I want to have you back on real soon. Hey, thanks, Chris. Hey, thanks a lot, Matt. And um, I'll talk to you uh, real soon. And hey, man, I loved it.